What would it mean if Canada did increase its defense spending? Retired General Rick Hillier served as chief of the defense staff from 2005 to 2008. He now advises several defense companies, including Quest and Packham Defense. He's with us from Las Vegas. General Hillier, good to see you as always. Thank you. Rashi, glad to be here. Uh, just quickly before I get into questions around defense spending, uh, we heard from the State Department today that they sense that Russia's uh, you know, more imminent move would be the use of chemical weapons and trying to blame it on Ukraine. Just wanted to get your initial reaction to that. Well, that would be an escalatory step that would, I think, enrage the world. And if something like that doesn't put uh, some steel in the spine of NATO and say, actually, you know something, trying to remain neutral in this invasion, this conflict, in, in this vulgarity, really, is not something that we can continue to do. And at the very minimum, along with all the packages of weapons and support, to the Ukrainian defense forces, we've got to do something like a no-fly zone, at least for the humanitarian routes that are coming out of, of uh, Ukraine. And, you know, you can maybe start it with humanitarian routes, start it in the west of Ukraine, uh, flood the eastern part of the Ukraine with ground-based air defense to give some more protection there, and then incrementally in increase it. But that's an escalatory step. It's a, it's a vulgar uh, way to attack an enemy if there's any good way indeed. And it would be an appalling example of Putin's characteristics and what he's willing to do. Uh, I think we, we can't wish away the lengths that he will go to to take Ukraine and then be prepared to coerce other nations that used to be part of the Warsaw Pact. Absolutely appalling. Uh, the, the appalling nature of, of what has happened even so far has certainly prompted a number of our allies in the very uh, near term to announce big increases in defense spending and allies like Germany, for example, and Poland to do so. Uh, that prompted my questioning to the, uh, the Minister of Defense in this country yesterday, in which she said she was putting forward those three different scenarios to uh, the finance minister because the budget is expected to come you know, sometime in the near future. I, I'm wondering what you think of the plausibility of defense spending in this country in excess of that 2% of GDP target. Uh, Vashi, first of all, I'd love to get to 2%. In fact, I'd love to get to 1.5%. I would think that this is something that we would want to do as a country. We want Canada to be a force for good in the world. And one of the best, most powerful, most flexible, most engaging tools are the men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces who wear our make believe on their shoulder. They can change the world if they have the training, the capability, and the numbers and the leadership to go and do so. And so I would think we would want to do that. But look, what I'd like to do is first get the 1.5%, then get the 2%, and then grow more than that, because everything that we invest in the Canadian Armed Forces is good for our nation at home and good for our nation in the global community in which we reside, because we can help shape it, we can help make it better, and we can become a voice that is listened to, that has credibility, because we can change the world with those increased armed forces and the capabilities. And I think the steps that you need to take are pretty straightforward and simple. I think it'd be a wonderful thing to do. I think Canadians should want to do that. I'm wondering if you have a sense that the political will has shifted one way or the other. And I ask because not only during your time as chief of defense staff, but since then, we've seen many different governments go by, some of which who have proposed meeting those targets, some of which have put forward a very detailed plan to do so over a number of years. But yet we have continued to, to fall short. Do you think because of the uh, current moment in time, and the current context, the political will might have shifted? Well, I, I certainly think there's an urgency and a pressure from this moment. I mean, look, we cannot bury our head in the sand like an ostrich here and pretend that the world is the same as it was three weeks ago before Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and, and, and put us on, you know, on the cusp of a war that is much larger than just the one in Ukraine itself. It, it's kind of like, you know, and, and I get to feel at times back in Ottawa, it's kind of like after 9-11, the day after that, the greatest sense of need in Ottawa was to get back to the day before 9-11. And right now, the feel is still there that somehow we can get back to the pre-invasion days. We cannot. The world has changed. There's a geopolitical change here. There's a shift in the way people are going to behave in nations around the world. And Canada, if it wants to help shape that world for all of us, has got to be stronger. It's got to be on the ground. So I think the pressure is greater than it's ever been. And, you know, Donald Trump, when he was president, like him or loathe him, what he stated about NATO was accurate, that NATO, the nations of NATO, by and large, were not upholding their end. Canada was more guilty than almost anyone else in that nation. And we became a parasite in NATO for many, many, many years. I think the pressure is certainly there. And if it's not on our government and the prime minister right now, then it certainly will be, not just from the United States, but from our European allies also. 
I was heartened to hear Germany step up and announce 2%, announce that they were buying the F-35 and announce that they were doing certain other things. Uh, that's absolutely incredible. And I believe that we should and can follow suit. I'm wondering what you would say to people who are concerned, though, about a couple of things. First of all, the price tag that increasing spending goes with. So, for example, if we were to hit that 2%, some analysts told me today that's about $15 billion in extra spending. Does that mean, you know, $15 billion towards defense and taken away from, from other areas? And second, uh, I noticed, for example, Angus Reid has done some polling about uh, people's sentiments and even just sending lethal aid to Ukraine. And, and some Canadians are kind of nervous about it. Uh, what, what do you say to those groups of people who, who express those concerns? Well, those, first of all, for the second part, those who are nervous about those kinds of things, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. It is right to be nervous. But you know something? Uh, sometimes the world needs to face up to dictators and bullies and, and sociopaths and psychopaths and killers like President Putin. And, and Canada has to be a part of it, helping that. We are a G7 nation, founding member of NATO, a founding member of, of the United Nations. And we were the lead in the responsibility to protect uh, security, uh, United Nations movement. And, and and so we've got to actually be able to step up and do some of those tough things when they need to be done and not just rely upon others to do it. And and so from the point of view of spending, we've always tried to divide down, oh, my goodness, we put it in defense, it's going to come out of here. You know something? We spend in defense. We spend across our nation. We move people from a lower uh, economic class into a middle class. That's certainly been one of the aims of our governments as we bring them into military forces, give them training and education, and, and, and let them develop their leadership, all while serving Canada in uniform. That, that money is spent across our nation in so many places and towns and cities and, and in companies and corporations. It comes back into the Canadian economic landscape in a very real way. That money is incredibly useful to Canada. It's not something that we just take from other programs and throw away. Uh, I think it's money well spent and it would be at least $15 billion more. But Vashi, if I could say one thing, before we ever talk about increasing spending, Let's go and fix something. And that's well within our power. It won't cost us a penny. Let's go fix our procurement process. Over the past five, six years, the Department of National Defense, shame on them, have turned back into the government of Canada more than $12 billion because it was not spent, because the procurement process was such a Gordian knot they could not navigate it, and money allocated for programs wasn't spent, turned back into the government. So pointless to give more money right now unless we can sort out the procurement process. Give the responsibility to the Minister of Defense, put it in the mandate letter, put other ministers responsible to he or she, and, and let them know that the number one overwhelming overriding goal is to procure for the Canadian forces what they need. And then the other things such as industrial regional benefits and all of those other things are secondary to that. Important, yes, but most important is getting the things that the Canadian forces need. That won't cost us a penny. And we could change the Canadian forces by doing it. Okay, General Hillier, I'll leave it there. Thanks again for your time. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, Vashi. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.